I'm a middle child. I'm a middle child. Ah. <laughs> uh, what do you label as your home? Ghana, being that's where I live, feels very much like home. One, one sometimes asks oneself, like, who, who is a scientist? Okay. And my, the youngest one is um, 15. So two boys. So, yeah, two boys. <laughs> <laughs> my mom has three boys, so I know oh, that wow. boys, are, oh, boys wow. are a handful. Boy, they are a handful. <laughs> they are a handful. But I feel like, like an African mother is a strict mother. Very. <laughs> Very. <laughs> Very strict. That, that sense that your passport, your gateway, to having a successful life comes through education. That's right. So the, the, the education just had a, a, a huge place in that upbringing. Everything was about going to school and what you did at school and the importance of having good grades and what you could do afterwards. Because we come from a very small country and we didn't have, any, we didn't have a university back in the Gambia. So to a large extent, I think there was a sense that if you wanted to make, a, make you know, if you wanted to have a good life, uh, there was no other trajectory than having a solid, you know, um, background and having great, um, you know, a, a good a good degree um, that could actually buy you out of whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. And we saw those models. We had good people that went out, studied, came back, um, and you know, made something out of their lives. Right. Did you feel like you were a science whiz in in the early years, or how did you kind of develop an acumen like? Not really. I wasn't very much science person. I don't even think I got good grades in science. I mean, I I've got I've had a kind of very eclectic background. Uh, I loved literature. For me, it was now how to take advantage of this uh, this passion and love I had for humanities. And so it gave you a good basis for understanding how you can think a little bit more analytically about issues. Um, and so you could be given anything. It could be a, a poem, um, a text from nowhere, and it allows you to use that analytical um, acumen um, and, and basically make something out of, out of it. So I think that the, the, the kind of um, looking at things critically um, comes from that training that um, you, you did the arts, you did the humanities before you went into the science. That's kind of pretty similar to me because I, I grew up loving philosophy yeah. and literature and I loved film and kind of the, the intersection between how human society like, is born and human geography was really interesting mm. to me, mm. specifically around migration yeah. and stories of identity Just because I feel like different people and being at some place at some time creates opportunity, creates adversity, and yeah. it just so happens that that shapes so much of yeah. not only their upbringing, yeah. but also how they see the world. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about your experience moving in from the arts and now the humanities into the sciences? Like? You know, coming from one world, which was totally humanities and kind of being in a world where much about the natural sciences talked about that a lot of you are thinking around biophysical things that are happening, That's right. um, especially in, a, in, a, in, in this sort of climate crisis, I think somehow extends your brain. I think we're in a much more privileged position um, with, this, with the humanities and the social science background to be able to use that as a kind of foundation. You can't come at it solely from a social science perspective. 
you also need to understand the biophysical dimension. When you're at a space like Climate Week mm -hmm. and at the UN, how or what voices do you find are missing? It's a lot more compelling to talk to somebody who has actually lived through a flood. That's right. More compelling to talk to somebody who has actually seen the faces of hunger. Yes. Uh, because they can, they can tell it in their own words, unfiltered. Right. Um, and so in those moments when you are sort of, you're, you're a carrier of a certain problem because you're, you're, you're projecting it forward. But you're not an authentic voice. Mm. And, and, and that, that I find frustrating sometimes. You know, I'm, I'm very mindful of that. Um, so in that way, some of my representation can be flawed um, because I'm, I'm, I'm telling the story from a policy perspective sometimes or I'm putting myself in the shoes of a policy maker. We can't engineer ourselves out of this problem without understanding how indigenous knowledge systems work, without taking into account that people who have been at the cold face um, of the crisis um, should also be included in that solution space. And that means you can't include something if you don't recognize it. Right. So the recognition comes from understanding that they also have a value system um, that might have been discounted. Mm. And that discounting is not something that happened overnight. Uh, part of it in the colonial project contributed to not recognizing knowledge in the way that it should be recognized. So Fatima, I feel like this coffee shop may take us uh, quickly outside of here. So if you just had one message for those who really want to understand the work of what climate action looks like, how can we inspire individuals to join the movement to be critical and to think and to start working on climate action issues? Well, the climate action, I think, is about our individual responsibilities. You know, what, do, what can we actually do to reduce the harm that's done to both ourselves and to the environment? So I think understanding the harm that's been done is one part of climate action because unless you understand it, you can't fix it. So I would say that's our first, we have to educate ourselves. So climate action doesn't mean that you have to have perfect knowledge of the science of climate change. It means you just have to begin to understand that we as human beings are actually in a situation where we're causing great danger and harm to our environment. We've created an overshoot in terms of our consumption patterns, our production patterns. And it's not just that we're going to pay for that overshoot, it has a price. But the price also has a, it has a human face. It's affecting people across different parts of the world. The fact of the matter is that the, 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 the overconsumption and production problems um, is affecting the people that have least contributed to this to this um, issue, and so those people are paying for it. They're paying for it with their lives. They're paying for it with their resources. They're paying for it in terms of their infrastructure. And I think once we start, you know, peeling those layers of understanding, you know, how what we do now is not just going to affect us. It's affecting our children. Um, there's, a, there's a huge part of intergenerational equity of, of making sure that we're, we're leaving a burden that is going to be too heavy for our children and their children to really be able to do something about. So our responsibility is to try and fix the problem to the best of our ability so that we don't um, overburden them and then realize that they don't have the resources to fix the problem as well. Wow. Thank you so much, Fatima. That Thank was you. fantastic. Thank you.
Okay. Oh my God. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs>